Paul Tillich once said, modern Protestantism is not able to create the next period of human history without the help of the older churches. This means for Tillich, without the help of a Greek Orthodox traditions. Such a help can, can come obviously not from any kind of dogmatic orthodoxy, but only from a free creative interpretation of the older traditions, as we found in it in Nikolai Berdyaev. Now this quote of Tillich about Berdyaev is quite remarkable because it shows the understanding and the assessment of the Berdyaev by a Western, by a Western theologian such as Tillich. But it's not the only Tillich that was appreciative of Berdyaev. People like Hannah Arendt in her, in her works, uh, or Dorothy Day, or even Martin Luther King Jr. are quoting Berdyaev in their works, in their theses, in their many several writings, as their source of inspiration, which actually shows the Berdyaev's, uh, Berdyaev's influence on these Western authors and what kind of a contribution he might have on the Western theology and philosophy in general. So normally Berdyaev is, for the West, he's normally imagined as a figure of orthodoxy coming to the West. And he normally, his name is normally, you would see, under the textbooks like Russian religious philosophy or, Rush, or, or Christian existentialism, as recently uh, George Patterson has put in his Oxford handbook of Russian religious thought. So Berdyaev is a kind of this multi-leveled uh, personality that can has an interesting appeal to, to Western authors. Uh, but in this, in this video, I want to focus on, uh, on a Berdyaev as a philosopher and what kind of a contribution did he make as a Christian philosopher to a Christian understanding and what kind of ecumenical implications we might have out of his work. So my, so my presentation will be in, in a several steps. The first part, we will look at some biographical data of the Berdyaev. Secondly, we will look at some of his works that he, that he published uh, during his time and posthumously, and what kind of a style we, we, might, we may discern in these works. And finally, we will look at some of his key terms, key philosophical terms, terms and how they play out in his, in his over. So Nikolai Berdyaev was born in 1874 in the village of Bukhova, uh, a village town near to Kiev, modern Ukraine. His family was aristocratic, of noble origins, also of aristocratic and military uh, background. His father was a kind of military officer in the Russian Empire. His mother had uh, close connections with the French nobility of his time. So he, he's quite, a, quite an interesting figure because in, he, he got a kind of this royal uh, royal noble uh, background to his, to, his, to his life. And he, he, his, his, his mother had a French connection, as I said, and also he had some Polish, uh, Polish origins in his, Polish, in, his, in his family life. And he is interesting in that regard, so he's coming from this kind of aristocratic military uh, family background, which, actually, which is going to shape his way of understanding some of his key philosophical terms, such as freedom. So when Berdyaev started to receive, he, he received his education, domestic education at home. Then he decided to go to the University of Kiev to study uh, first natural sciences, then he moved to law, and then finally he ended up with philosophy, doing a philosophy. He became a professor of philosophy, and already early on, Firstly, in the university, when he was, as he was studying philosophy, he was he was got attracted very much with Marxism. So he got politically very interested in Marxism, something that is similar to to other Russian figures such as Sergei Bulgakov, which that started he also started with Marxism and ended up with Christianity, Christian philosophy. But Berdyaev was was appealed. Uh, the Marxism was appealing to Berdyaev, and he began to to question the things like that, what, what kind of a philosophical path is he going to do? And he started already working out with other uh, Russian philosophers of his time, like, such as Simeon Frank of that time. And today, the, together they, they founded a couple of like, philosophical clubs, such as Landmarks or uh, new, new Middle Ages. This is uh, something that he moved on already from Marxism. He, you know, 
he was, he was appealed by Marxism, but it didn't take that much while to him to completely, to completely embrace Marxism. But it, it was a kind of a short period that he was interested in Marxism. But hence, surely on, he moved on from Marxism to much more idealistic philosophy. So in 1917, uh, October Revolution happens, uh, a Bolshevik revolution that dethrones the Romanov's family, royal family, and murders the entire family, and a new social order is established. With it, Berdyaev is, is also, with the, with the same time, Berdyaev founds uh, an academy, uh, which he calls the Academy of Spiritual Culture, which focuses mostly on the spiritual upbringing that he, can, that he was hoping to be kind of a, would be kind of a different from the previous imperial model that he was thinking, which, 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 which he was not very happy with. But he was hoping that the uh, revolution might bring something new on it. Uh, the, the academy lasts three years, for three years. In 1920, Berdyaev is elected as a professor at the University of Moscow. But soon after, conspiracy theories are, are, hang, are haunting him from the Soviet, some, some of the Soviet officials. And he's actually arrested twice in, in 1920s until 21. Uh, being accused of some political conspiracy theories of his time, which he was not really, really engaged at much, but he was much more on the philosophical side. But in the Soviet period, if you're expressing any idea that is going to be related to some political situation of the time, you, 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 you are becoming a, a suspicious person. So he was, he was arrested twice. First time he was, he was released. It was a short period of his time. The second time when he was arrested, it was in 1921, he was very directly told so he, he, that he needed either to leave a country or being shot, or being dead, or being executed, or killed. This is something that he will, this is the Berdyaev's assessment, at least what he talk, th talks about in his later journals. He, he says, I was very clearly said, clearly told, that either leave a country or you're going to be dead. So that's how the, that's how the situation uh, played out at that time. But it actually took a couple of months for Berdyaev to leave a country because it took a couple of paperwork and a couple of gatherings of his, because as a royal family, he had it also property. So this, was, this all of the things to gather up and leave the country it was quite stressful, obviously, for him. And, but he got it, and he first moved to Berlin, to Germany, when he had an opportunity to meet with such an interesting philosopher like Max Scheller and Oswald Spengler. And he got, the, got a good interaction with them. However, he didn't stay at Berlin. He, he did stay at Berlin for a while, but it didn't, didn't take that much. He soon after moved to Paris, and he settled in the near, near, uh, near one of the suburbs of Paris. And when he actually started to write his, his major works of this time. And th that's, the, that's the main idea, that's the main, these are the main stages of Bilzaev's life. So, from the Soviet, from the Russian, Russian Empire, right to the Soviet period, the beginning of Soviet period, then moving to Berlin for a while, and then finally settling in, in Paris, where his all philosophical discussions went. And he got a, quite interactions with the several philosophers and theologians of that time also. Uh, people like Emmanuel Mounier, the founder of personalism, was, was in, they were in close interactions with each other. Paul Tillich, as I said earlier, where they actually met each other and talk quite a bit. And as a result, Paul, uh, Paul Tillich actually wrote this remarkable quote and the article, and he actually published one of the articles of Berdyaev in one of his journals. From Tillich, uh, Berdyaev also got this notion of the Kairos of the time. So there was a good ex in interaction with them. From theologians, Berdyaev interestingly also interacted with Karl Barth of his time. We don't know that much of what kind of things played out, but we certainly know that they were interacting with each other. And it would be an interesting thought to, to just, there would be an interesting research for a PhD to do uh, this interaction with Karl Barth and Nikolai Berdyaev. But he, he, was, he was in the middle of the, of, of, the, of the things, as you said, as you might say, and he, was, and he was interacting with the West very much closely at that time. And he wrote major, his major works in Paris, while he, while he was in Paris, his mature theological works. So Nikolai Berdyaev died in 1948 at his working desk 
from heart attack. Two weeks earlier before his death, he completed his, one of his major works, The Kingdom of Spirit and the Kingdom of Caesar. And he was buried in the Clamart, a city near to Paris, in the city cemetery of Bois d'Ardot. He was nominated for a Nobel Prize for seven times in literature between 1942 to 1948. So Be Bezaev's life ends up, starts in the Imperial Russia and ends up in the, in the exile in the Paris when he interacts many people, with many people of his time, philosophers and theologians, such as Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, Emmanuel Mounier, Gabriel Marcel, Oswald Spengler, and so on. And as such as he brings all these interactions into his into his philosophical works, to which we are now moving to. Yeah. Coming to the works of Birdjaev, uh, he was a prolific writer, covering many topics of his time. So he will, he will, it's difficult to pin down to one or two themes in Birdjaev. So he will, he will, if, you list, if, you, if you're going to list his works, you will find something like from Marxism to political philosophy, right to the philosophy of gender, like the, the philosophy of Eros, how he imagines the gender, how he imagines the pol politics of his time, how he will he also write the idea of Russian destiny, of the Russian soul. So he's covered many, many topics of his time as he interacts with different people of his time. His works are mainly about about how, how, what, kind of a, what kind of a people, what kind of events took his place and he was trying to tease out in his works. But he also imagined that his works are more about embodiment of what he believes in that. So it was, a, for me, for him, the, the, the works were more a performances rather than something ana analytical works that he would put into the paper. It was something embodying, and it was an action of his. Now, as, as, you, as I said, there are many, but I've had many works, but there are, there are several books that, that he's famous for. Among them are the philosophy of the spirit, philosophy of, of, of freedom. Another one is what, we, what in English we normally translate as the, as the meaning of the creative act. Uh, among others, it will be the meaning of history. Also, the idea that another book which is, which is famous for him, it, which, which was actually published posthumously after his death, uh, which, is called, which is normally translated as self-knowledge, although the a better translation might be self apprehension or self-perception, uh, because the word, the Russian word for is samapaznanya, and the word paznanya is comes from the word. It's actually close to Greek one, which means ginosko, which means to know, to apprehend, to cover. It's it's more about personal knowledge than rather than objective knowledge, propositional knowledge. So Berdyaev has a couple of works, these, but these are the works that normally put him on the spot, like people will come up again and again to these works, like the meaning, of, the meaning of creative act, which is again not very good translation in English. Uh, the word in English, the word in Russian, it would be much more to a creativity or imagination, something that goes on rather than limits on a one point like act. Act is always has a beginning at the end, whereas in Berdyaev it's actually an ongoing uh, process to which I will come shortly. Uh, but later on, he's, he's most, I guess, if you want to know what Berdyaev is actually doing in his overall philosoph philosophical understanding, it would be the work Slavery and Freedom, which is, which is, which is these, this is the, the English translation of the book. However, the Russian one is much more interesting, which can be translated something like that, something like this. On, on the bondage and the liberty of human beings, an exercise in personalistic metaphysics. You might see that there's a, there's a huge difference between uh, an original title and the English one. English one is quite short. But this is the work that you normally will go on if you want to study main ideas of the Dev. So slavery and freedom, meaning of the, the meaning of creative act, the meaning of history, and the, and the philosophy of freedom. And also, if you want some uh, biographical data, also uh, it will be self-knowledge, which is how it is more is more about the reflections born out of the personal experience rather than biographical data, data than that Dev gives about it. 
But what, what is significant in his style, in his style as a philosopher, what kind of a style is, does he employ in his writing? He is not a systematician. He, you would not find in his writing a systematic thinking. Uh, but he, he, he will normally confess him to, to, to his readers saying, you know, I was never a systematic. And he, he, it will be difficult to find some coherency even in his thoughts. If, you, if, you're, if you're seeking something or coherent, systematic, neat understanding of things, uh, Berdev is going to disappoint you. Instead, what he, he's writing you might, you might characterize as, as aphoristic, something that is more peculiar to Nietzsche rather than, say, let's say, to Hegel. Uh, in in Berdev, you would find a short, short sentences. It's, he's, not a, he's, not a, he's not a writer of long sentences and a long long meaning. He might even repeat at some point himself in, in, in different cases about what he's actually doing in his job. So an aphoristic author who is doing who is kind of these performances, these, these, these works that he does, the style that you might characterize is an is a aphorism, art aphorism, similar to Nietzsche. And interestingly, he quotes Nietzsche very much in his, in his, in his, in his writing, already some as a preambulus of his thought. So a style when, you, when we go to the style of Berdyaev, is a more aphoristic style, which, make, which actually engages with you very much. Some of there are many memorable, uh, memorable uh, sentences that you can get from his writings, which actually prompts you to think, actually, rather than to, to, to follow a system, the system of a thought. So he's very free in that sense, and he's very actually embodying what he's advocating for, for which is the freedom to which I will come. I, 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 want, I want to focus on one of his titles so that to uh, make sure what he is actually doing. I, as I said, he is doing an aphoristic. His style is aphoristic, but he the the one of one a couple of his works, the titles of his works in Russian, in original, actually give us the understanding of what kind of a what kind of a work does he want to what kind of a task is he up to. So. One of those you will see, like what we translate in English, like the meaning of the creative act. This is the English translation. In Russian, it goes something different. It will be the meaning of creativity, an exercise or an exercise or an experiment in justification of human being. Another title will be the meaning of history. Subtitle is an exercise in the philosophical understanding of human destiny. Again, another one, it will be on the destiny of human beings or the destiny of man. This is how normally translated in, in English. A subtitle in Russian, it will be an exercise in paradoxi paradoxical ethics. So if you, if you, if you notice, the, the subtitles always come with the, some, some the idea of the exercise or, or practicing or experimenting something like that. In, in the Russian word is opet, which in, in, in English it, it may mean different. It can mean experiment, it can mean experience, it also mean, mean, can mean practicing. It seems that Berdev got this understanding from a French, from a French philosophy, because the, this idea of opet or exercise is quite resembling with the Russian essay things that he went through. So it's an, it's a, it's an attempt. It's an exercise, it's a practice, it's a performance. It's not something that you, it's not very conclusive and it's not a permanent. So what he's trying to do is actually prompting, exercising things. As I said, it's a performance. What he, he imagines his work to be a performative things that he's doing for, for different ways. And he's it, and it actually focused on different topics, as you say, but it always starts with this idea of experimenting things. It's not, it's not conclusive. And it also resembles with his, with his overall understanding as an existentialist. There is no essence, there is an existence. So the main point is on exercising what existence brings forth. So this would be the main focus of the Berdev. Uh, and interestingly, the Russian titles gives a better understanding of what he is up to. Again, on the, on the idea of what we call slavery and freedom, he would put in Russian, it would be on the slaver or on the bondage and the freedom of human being, an exercise or an experiment in personalistic metaphysics, which is also interesting for, for which again goes back to the idea of experimenting, practicing things. So he's a practitioner. 
his, his main work can be, can be seen as a practicing a philosophy that he is, that he is doing. He is not detached. His philosophy is not detached from his life. He is trying to bring this idea together. And as such, he is bringing a valuable contribution. So coming to the major philosophical themes in Berdzeev's works, uh, we can tease out a couple of them, if we look. Uh, but the, I guess four, four words can summarize what he's actually doing, if we want to summarize, if, if it's in any way possible so, to summarize someone's thoughts. But it will, if, you, if you're going to summarize Berdzeev's thoughts around what, kind of a, around what kind of a concepts that he develops his philosophy, it would be freedom, it would be personality, it would be human, humanity, human beings, and it will be the vocation. And finally, if we, can, if we want to add the fifth one, it will be creativity. So these five major concepts that around which Bedev builds, or rather embodies his philosophy, would be freedom, human personality, humanity or humanness, vocation, mostly the vocation of human beings, and finally creativity. So it, let's start with the creativity. As I said in earlier, uh, he, one of his works, Smissel Dworchestra, is translated as the meaning of the creative act. So in this translation, what, while it captures the meaning, the main, the main sense of what Berdzeev is doing, it, it's, it's quite limited because it thinks of the act, an act that always has a beginning and the end, it's always a limited thing. Whereas what Berdzeev imagines with the creativity is about imagination and creativity. So for him, philosophy is not so much an academic and rational endeavor, but a more artistic endeavor, which something, again, makes him closer to, to Tillich as earlier. They both imagine philosophy as a kind of artistic endeavor. It's a more performative endeavor. But also, uh, creativity, that's one of the things of how Berdzev imagines religiosity as such. For him, religi religiosity is not about obedience, it's not about fear, it's not even awe or reverence or wonder. But it's a creativity. The task of a, of a human being as a religious person, but also as a human being, because it doesn't distinguish between religious and secular. That's a, it's a, modern, it's a modern concept, or something that I've never, never accepted. For him, philosophy and theology, they always go together. And for Berdyaev, the meaning of the, of the human beings is creativity, because they are created in the image and likeness of God. And God is the creator. So for Berdyaev, he has, he has a special work on the salvation and creativity. And he would say salvation actually limits the understanding of human being. You know, the point of human being is not to be saved by God, but it's actually to create like God. So for him, he would, he would be quite critical on the Western notion of the point of, of the human, of human life is to achieve salvation. For him, it will be very, very limiting the understanding of what human beings are supposed to do. For him, the, the meaning of human beings is about creating things as God, out of nothing, as God creates. So it's about continuing being co-creators with God, be it in the realm of family, be it in the social realm, or be it in the terms of technology. It's interesting, his ideas of technology are quite interesting. He has an ambiguous double uh, attitude towards technology. At one point, he would say technology leads to artificiality, on the other hand, he would he would be very he would be very critical on these on his uh, imperial Russian situation when you have uh, agriculture and he said you know you, you know Russians should have taken the example from the West and developed an economy which is much more technology based you know so he had this, this double uh, attitude toward the techne to Russia, to use the, the Greek word and he was and he was trying to to kind of negotiate things because for for him technology at one point is related to imagination and creativity, that you something that you create and advances human flourishing in some sense. You would still go to a dentist, we still go to, to certain, uh, to certain uh, ideas. We, we use the technology in medicine, we use technology in different lives, in, in our lives. This very recording is based on technology, which we're doing, which is about spreading and advancing communications. So, what, so that was, was the idea of Berdyaev. It's about it's, technology is imaginative as long as it advances human flourishing. But on the other hand, he was quite suspicious about technology becoming an, a, an end to itself rather than a means towards creativity. So that's, this is a one part of Berdyaev about creativity. Now, if we move to another 
theme of his thought, which is freedom. This is a central idea of Berdeyev. And the word freedom is actually not very helpful in English, <laughs> because in freedom, when we say freedom in English, we normally, at least in the popular imagination, freedom is normally associated, is associated with free choice, when we come to a religion. It's about, free ch it's about my choices, whether I'm making a choice or not. It's about also freedom from or freedom for or liberty, sometimes we, uh, in our English understanding it would be you know, free, you know, a free country, it's a free market, something that is not bounded or imposed somebody else, you know, free countries. But, uh, so we imagine freedom in this, in this kind of a economic or a kind of a psychological sense or intellectual sense, you know, you know, freedom of speech and so on. Now, Bedev doesn't deny all of that, but when he talks about freedom, he actually means something different, something more substantial, something, as you might guess, existential. Uh, interestingly, again, the word freedom in Russia, it has the same meaning as in English today as it used. But the word freedom, svoboda, it comes from the root from svoj, ownership, which is means my own, which in this case we might translate in case of Berdev, freedom is about ownership, it's about autonomy, it's about independence, and also in some sense it means something owning your own destiny. It, it, so it's not something uh, designed for liberty. It's, it's a much more closer to what we might call today in sovereignty, something that somebody cannot corrupt myself, somebody can, that is something un, uncorrupted, undestructible, something closer to dignity even, to a better understanding. So when he writes about the freedom, he, he, would, he would almost talk about it as a kind of metaphysic. He develops a metaphysics of freedom. In that sense, the, the work Slavery and Freedom, as it stands out in English, is a good case study of how I understand freedom. It was written later on his, in his life, and it sometimes summarizes what he understands by freedom when he says. It's interesting, if we look at the, at the subtitles or the content of the book, of the, of the, of the work it actually goes like this. He will, he will, he will list all other things alongside the freedom, and he will say the freedom is much more primary. So he will go like being and freedom, the slavery of man to being, God and the freedom, nature and the freedom, society and the freedom, and then individualism and the freedom, and then he will go to freedom and the state, freedom and the war, freedom and aristocracy, freedom and the bourgeoisie, freedom and revolution, freedom and collectivism, freedom and beauty, and freedom and sex. So in all of these things, he, he goes on to list all of them and compare and contrast with them, saying each one of them is not bad, but you're always going to be a slave to one or another. Just start with the being, let's just start with the being, being and freedom. At the very beginning, Berdeh would say, freedom is, is primary than the being. In other words, he would put that metaphysics is not ontology. So for him, being, the, the occupation of philosophy with being is actually was a tragedy for him. Because he would say, freedom is actually much more primary than the being itself. Now, this sounds paradoxical, which is not surprising for Berdeh because he's not aiming to be coherent in his thought. He's actually making an aphoristic thought, aphoristic gesture saying,
So, what, so it is important also to sort of highlight what is the relationship between Nikolai Berdyaev and Eastern Orthodoxy. As I said, for the West, Berdyaev is predominantly perceived as, as a kind of orthodox figure, somebody who is doing a kind of Eastern Orthodox theology. And it would be a fair description, actually, because if you if we if we list some of his, if you look uh, in the cursory mat matter, look at his writings of Berdyaev, he would definitely defend Eastern Orthodoxy. He would, in one of his writings, he would say, Eastern Orthodoxy is a kind of a, a better form of Christianity compared to Catholicism and Protestantism. And he would actually say that it's a it's a very it's a hidden treasure. He would definitely identify himself as an Eastern Orthodox. If you ask him, he would not identify him as a Catholic or a Protestant. And so for he had, he had this very high view of Eastern Orthodoxy, and he thought that he belongs to that branch of Christianity. And actually, he would put it as a branch, not the, the entire, not, the, not, not, the, not, the, not an exclusivist matter. He would not say the Eastern Orthodoxy is the only way, is the only form of Christianity, but say it's, it's a better form of Christianity compared to Catholicism. However, if we look another, if, if we look at it, it is another, another parts of his work, he, he would, he would be, there would be another, another, another contrast to it. So while he would say Eastern Orthodoxy, he would prefer to be identified as an Eastern Orthodox. If you, if you look at his writings, it would be very, very difficult to find him quoting church fathers or quoting liturgy, at least the Eastern liturgy. You would much more find him quoting Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Jakob Biome, German idealist, uh, philosophers of his time, Karl Barth, uh, Emmanuel Mounier. So he would, he would match very much quote, if you, if, you, if you open up his books, you would more end up with the Western authors than <laughs> the Eastern fathers, although he would say, I'm an Eastern Orthodox. So there's an ambiguity in, in relation to Bidzev, in his relationship to Orthodoxy. He would, was very critical of the institutional church of his time. In fact, he wrote a, 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 a short paper for, for which he was, tes he was <laughs> condemned for, for exile to Siberia, which, which he like, luckily uh, escaped. But he, he, had this, he had this short paper called Extinguishes of Spirit, in which he was very, very harsh about his synodal church of his time. Uh, as we know, at that time, the Russian church didn't have a patriarch because the, the emperor Peter the Great it abolished the, the patriarch and there was a synod running out, which was more a kind of a, a state mechanism at that time. But he was very critical about the, about, this, about, the, about the church of his time, about the institutional parts of the church, and he'd label them as the ones who are extinguishing the spirit. You might, for, for Western readers, that might sound as a charismatic theme about, you know, extinguishing the spirit, the spirit that, you know, and he actually got, actually, it seems he got from Bible again from Paul, you know, don't quench the spirit. So it, it's a very, it's, it's, he got it very this charismatic kind of understanding. He was very in favor of the Mount Athos monastics in, in, in contrast to the institutional church. He would write many, many he, would, he would be again very critical about the, about the rights of the human beings in orthodoxy. He would say it's not mature enough to, to support the human rights at that time. So he, he's an ambiguous figure in terms of, he, if you if want to uh, associate himself with the Eastern Orthodox, he is an Eastern Orthodox, but he's, he's not quite that Eastern Orthodox, you might put it. And he, he's, he has this double, and, uh, double attitude toward Orthodoxy. At one point he would say Orthodoxy is a better form, but again we don't, it, it's, very, it's very difficult to understand what he means by Orthodoxy in this case, because he, as he doesn't quote, the fathers, he doesn't quote the liturgy. It's, it's very difficult to understand what he means exactly by orthodoxy when he, when he says it's a better form of Christianity. What kind of a tradition, what kind of a reality is he referring to? Most probably he's referring to overall ethos and understanding uh, of the East, you know, Eastern Orthodox as he found himself in, the, in his living circumstances. Like for him, Eastern Orthodox is the cradle of, of freedom in, in a relationship to, in contrast to to Catholicism, which is authoritarian at that time, which is more based on the institution, on the one hand, and Protestantism for him was more individualistic religion. And he saw kind of a thought that the Eastern Orthodoxy 
as a reality, as existence, being as an Eastern Orthodox, you are actually free. You're not actually dogmatically strict to think in this particular way, nor you are free to choose whatever you want to, re to read. At least that was his perception of these two traditions, Catholicism or Protestantism, as he encountered of his time. So in that way, you might say he is, a pro he is, a, he is an Eastern Orthodox in a way that he founds in the living existence of this tradition that he wanted to do. But again, it seems to be, it's, it's, it's fair to say when we read Berdyaev that he's an Eastern Orthodox, but he's not the one that we normally or traditionally accustomed to. Also, we don't find him in his interesting, he would, he, he would rarely, if not, if, not, if not ever, he would quote icons or put the importance of icons. Instead, if you, if you read Berdyaev, you might even, even read him as a kind of a, as a simple Christian, you might. He is very close in that sense what we call the, the C.S. Lewis Christianity. You know, it's a kind of a mere Christianity thing that you, that you come to. He would talk about the resurrection of the body. He would talk about the incarnation as a key component of, of theology. He would talk very much about the this freedom and how it plays out. And one of the interesting points of it would be anthropology, philosophical and theological anthropology. The key for him is the human being is the human being, his freedom, his vocation, his personality, and his creativity. It's not a system, it's not even a god in that sense, he's not, he's not a theologian in that sense, he's not focusing on God or the nature of God or the doctrine of God, not only the Trinity that much, but the human beings and, and, how, it, and how Christian tradition actually gives resources to imagine a human being in this contemporary world. Which actually brings us to the idea of what is his contribution to a modern world and, ecumenic, and ecumenical relations. So what is the importance of Berdyaev in the ecumenical context or in the context of modern world? So let me, be, let me go back to the, to the quote that I started, started the video with the quote of Tillich, which, which says the modern Protestant churches are, need, are in need of recovery all the, of all the traditions in a creative way. And in that sense, Berdyaev is very helpful in teasing out that not a dogmatic orthodoxy, but the creativity that he brings in it. So I think that's, this, is the, this is a good capture of what Berdyaevs can offer for the contemporary world and in ecumenical context. In the contemporary world, in the modern world, in terms of modernity, Berdyaev stands out as somebody who can offer, offers a fresh vision of, of how humanity and human beings are, can, can, be, can be conceived. As I said, many people were, were draw inspiration from his writing, some, like, Hannah Arendt, Martin Luther King, and Dorothy Day, all in different contexts. One is in terms of totalitarianism in case of Arendt, and in case of Dorothy Day in a social workers case, but also in case of Martin Luther King in much more political and social realities. So Berdyaev comes up as a, somebody who says, at the centrality of all our endeavors that we do as a human beings, as a human society, stands the human person, and not a system, not a state, and not any other, re any other aspects of human life. And today's world that we live in, in a much more of crisis and uncertainty and war, and in different uh, contexts, Berdev gives that in all of that, in all of these messy situations that we find by ourselves, whether it will be a totalitarian state, whether it will be a war, a crisis, a social crisis, a personal crisis, at the end of the day, the cent the cent at the center of our imagination and, and task is a human being, his, perso his personality with his own dignity and his freedom and creativity. That matters most. In one of his lectures, Ron Williams, when he was asked, what do you see the kind of a, the topic of the day for theology? What is the, 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 the increasing theme of, the, of theology for the day? He would answer, it's a human being. It's anthropology is what Berger concerns with. What, what's a human being is all about? In the 14th century, church was occupied with this Trinitarian question, how is our relationship with God, what is the Trinity, how Christ is the Christ, and how Jesus is the Christ.